So thank you for joining um, the Women Who Code F Sharp workshop with Olo. Uh, I'm Kate. I'm one of the event leaders for Women Who Code in the Silicon Valley chapter. And I'm also an engineering manager for Olo. So I'm really excited for tonight's event. Um, Olo is hosting, so we get to share a bit about my company with all of you. And then also my colleague Wallace, who is a really valuable engineer um, at Olo and also an excellent teacher will be presenting tonight's workshop. So um, I'm really looking forward to it. And so let's get started. Um, so if this is the agenda, I'm gonna give a brief intro to Women Who Code for those of you who aren't familiar with the organization. Um, Shilpa, who is our technical recruiter, will be giving an introduction to Olo. Um, and then Wallace will kick off with an introduction to the functional uh, programming and then hands-on coding exercise. Um, so while we're going through this intro too, it might be a good time to make sure that you have um, everything set up. Um, there's some instructions both in, in the meetup and then also in Git if you've had the chance to download that already. Um, and uh, you can start going through some of those um, setup steps. So. So our mission at Women in Code is to inspire women to excel in technology careers. And this includes helping women start or return to technical careers, be successful in their technical careers and stay in their technical careers. Uh, women Who Code is a global organization in 134 countries with a network of over 290,000 technical women. And right now we are all remote, so you can follow or attend events with communities all over the world. There are also six deep dive technical tracks. They include blockchain, cloud, Python, mobile, data science, and front end. And each of these have an associated website, which is womenwhocode.com slash track, so slash blockchain, slash cloud, Etc. And then there's also really active Slack channels associated with each one of these topics. So you can go to the website and find out more about getting an invitation to the Slack channels, which are open to anyone. Um, and then we are also always looking for volunteers. So there's a lot of benefits to volunteering with Women in Code. You can see that some of these, our opportunities here include um, event leadership, social media volunteers, host management volunteers. Um, and then partnerships. And we also do have um, opportunities for people to help out with the Women Who Code website um, and other opportunities to grow your skill sets. Um, but some of the benefits, of course, include public speaking, gaining uh, leadership skills, <laughs> presenting in your expertise, um, and then also, of course, networking. And we have a code of conduct, this is it. Um, our events are open to anyone who supports our mission. We are an inclusive community and we ask that you be respectful of everyone in our events. Um, we do not tolerate harassment of members in any form. And uh, the link here, womenwhocode.com code slash code of conduct is where you can read the full details um, of our code of conduct. And then finally, this is how you can connect with us. Um, we have meetups, obviously, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter. Um, and then, as I mentioned, we're also really active in Slack. So you can go to our website um, and learn more about different ways to connect and, of course, um, be a volunteer. I'll share this again at the end of the event so you can check out more ways to get involved. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Shilpa. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Shilpa. I'm a senior technical recruiter at Olo. And I wanted just a quick opportunity to introduce myself on behalf of our recruiting team, uh, just to run through a quick Olo, sorry, a quick introduction of who we are, uh, what it's like to work here, and also offer myself and my team as a resource if you find yourself interested in any of our openings um, or you're just interested in hearing more. We would be happy to uh, get in touch with you and, and share more information. 
question. Uh, so just a bit about us. Uh, back, we, we came around about 16 years ago, back in 2005, where we set out to create convenience with ordering ahead by sending text message orders to busy restaurants. And we've really evolved over the last 16 years to become an enterprise SaaS platform that powers digital ordering and delivery for hundreds of restaurant brands across the US. Um, so a few quick uh, facts about us. Whilst we have our headquarters in New York City, we are a remote first company. And so about 70% of our team is distributed across the US. Uh, those that are close to the office in New York City, they can choose whether or not they would like to work there. It's definitely helped us um, you know, find great team members across the US and offering our employees that flexibility uh, really promotes that work-life balance piece, which is um, absolutely one of our values at Olo. Um, as a company, we've also seen immense growth. Uh, I've been at Olo for two years now, and I've seen the team uh, more than double in size to be 500 today. Uh, we have about 300 in our product and engineering teams, and we're continuously growing. Um, all the time. So we have a ton, tons of openings uh, for software engineers, back end, front end, full stack. So uh, Kate, if you could go to the next slide. So please feel free to check out our careers page. Um, I, I, I did also want to mention that we are really big on diversity and inclusion. We really strive to create an inclusive environment where employees can <clears throat> really grow and celebrate their authentic selves. Um, even though we are mainly remote, we offer tons of opportunities for employees to get together. We're hosting the Olo Olympics this week. So I got to watch my coworkers uh, have a wing eating competition, which was definitely the highlight of my day. Uh, so I think it's safe to say we, we definitely have a lot of fun here at Olo. And we're, we're definitely, you know, constantly striving to continuously build diverse teams and also have an inclusive environment to come, go alongside that. Um, so I wanted to call out a few of our ERGs that really celebrate each other's, you know, diverse backgrounds. Um, examples are Olo Vets, Olo Women's Network, Olo Pride, Olo Parents, and there's a ton more. So again, if you find yourself interested in any of our openings that are listed on our careers page, you can just head to olo.com slash careers. Um, <clears throat> please feel free to reach out to us at careers at olo.com. That will route to one of our recruiting team, and we'd be happy to get in touch just to give you any uh, more information or answer any questions you might have. Uh, thank you, Shilpa. Um, and I think with that, I'm going to turn it over to Wallace. I'm going to stop sharing now. And we can go ahead and get started with the workshop. Oh. Wallace, you're on mute. What a total beginner mistake. As I was saying, I have been so happy working at Olo. So if you are interested, I would encourage you to apply. Uh, so let's jump right into this topic, F-sharp, immutability, and the MVU pattern. I'm very excited to talk about this topic, which I've been learning the uh, last few years, just uh, so you'll know a little bit about me. I uh, left academia in the previous century, which seems like a long time ago now. And since then, I've moved from corporate R&D to an independent contractor. I've been done training, uh, like uh, week-long courses in, in corporate environments. I've taught at universities, worked at startups. And so I've had that uh, full range of experience. I'm listed as an inventor on seven patents. You may be interested in my evolution of programming languages. And so you may recognize some of these and have familiarity with some of these. When I was a kid, I started with a beginner's all-purpose symbolic instruction code language and went on from there until now I am, would prefer to program in F-sharp. Um, so here's the outline of what we'll be talking about. We've already seen a little bit about your presenter for tonight. Next, I'd like to make sure that we get your uh, environments set up by uh, downloading the Docker images. I'll walk you through that in just a moment. This is a very much a hands-on opportunity. And uh, since we do have such a small 
uh, number of participants. I hope that we'll have a lot of interactions and that we can have success for everyone. So I certainly wanted to aim for that. Once we get all those, uh, the setup of your machine started running in the background, then we'll switch back to the slides and talk about the evolution of software paradigms, how we got to F sharp and functional programming in general. Then I'll use F sharp as an example of a functional first language and give you a chance to do some demos yourself and talk about immutability, which was one of the, the, um, the key elements of functional programming. And we'll tr get some experience with that. Talk about the model view update pattern. You may have heard of other patterns. Model view controller is very popular. If you commit to immutability, and I'll explain why you might want to do that. If you commit to immutability, then the model view update pattern becomes very attractive. And then at the end, we'll have a lot of hands-on practices, uh, opportunities for hands-on practice. Please feel free to jump in and ask questions that we're, as we're going through this. My goal is that at the end of this workshop, you will be motivated to adopt functional techniques. So even if you're not going to be using F Sharp, almost all languages are adding new features that support functional techniques. So even if you're going to be doing Python or Java or C Sharp, you'll have an opportunity to apply what we're learning. I would like for you to be able to describe the MVU pattern, particularly in the concept, uh, along with that concept of immutability. And lastly, I just wanna give you a taste of F Sharp. So you should have some experience at the end of this editing F Sharp code. As we're going through this, you'll see there are two types of slides. You've got the ones with the white background where uh, I'll be talking mostly. Again, feel free to jump in and ask questions. And then there's some with a blue background, which is slides where uh, you get a chance to try some things hands on. And there we are, a blue background. So hopefully you, in preparation for this, elect, for this uh, webinar, you have installed Visual Studio Code and Docker Desktop. And those do take a little bit longer. So that's the intent. The intention was to have those before we get started. So if you could start both of those up on your machine, make sure that you have Visual Studio Code running and Docker, and I will do the same. I'm looking down here in the bottom. Yep, there we go. So I have Docker running and I have Visual Studio Code. So this is the Docker desktop and the dashboard will show me what containers I have running. I don't have any running right now. And then I have Visual Studio Code here on my other screen, also up and ready to go. Okay. Um, let me know if you have any problems. Some of those can be really challenging, but um, hopefully you work through those ahead of time. So if you could go to Visual Studio Code now and let's see, what does this say? It says, open the extensions activity bar. If you're not familiar with code yet, a key part of the UI is this activity bar over here on the left. And one of them is the extension one. You can get that with command shift X. And these are all the extensions that you can add to Visual Studio Code. And the one that we want to install is remote containers. And the reason we want to install this is because all the coding that you're going to be doing is going to be running inside a Docker container. So we're not going to put any, we're not going to install any new version of Node or NPM or um, Webpack or any of that stuff and corrupt your machine. This will all be inside a container. When you're done, you can just delete that container and there'll be no evidence of it ever being on your machine. Uh, and so that's, that's what this extension for Visual, uh, Visual Studio Code supports is being able to run code on your local machine inside your host, but then have it um, editing and running code inside a container. So you want to click there and make sure that that's installed. Mine's already installed, of course. And so get that installed. Any questions about that? If not, we can continue on. Once that is installed, we can, in Visual Studio Code, <coughs> can do uh, open the command palette. <laughs> Sounds like maybe there's a question, but it's a little garbled. Could you try that again? Or not? Okay. So Control Shift P or 
Command Shift P will bring up the um, command palette. And this is where in Visual Studio Code, you can access um, additional commands. And the one that we want to access, um, it has the words container volume in it. And the specific command we want is listed here on the slide, uh, clone repository in a container volume. Remote containers, clone repository in a container volume. And once you do that, it will give you the option to clone a repository from GitHub, which is currently the only option for me, at least maybe, I don't know, maybe you'll have some others, but choose the one for GitHub because that is where we are uh, hosting the code for this workshop. And then at this point, if you have not run Visual Studio Code and connected to GitHub, you'll get several other dialog boxes and asking you to log into GitHub and then give Visual Studio Code permission so you'll have to go through and accept those and say yes, and then it'll bounce back to Visual Studio Code. But eventually, um, you'll get back to where it's asking you for the repository name. And you can see there, number four, uh, you enter women who, or WW code slash SV, or dash SV rather, and then slash. And then code will go out and list some of the repositories that are available there. If you don't see F Sharp Workshop listed, then you can type it all in. It should work, but um, and you, it may show up there on the drop down. And then it'll ask you about the branch, and we're going to choose the main branch. The solution is there on the on GitHub in case you want to access it, but uh, select the main for now. To main, main or master? Uh, for the F sharp workshop, it should be main. Okay. Good question. And then it's going to start downloading all the images that it needs for this container. And if you would like to see it going through and doing its work, you can click on where it says uh, starting dev container show log and a lot of text will scroll by as it's going through and setting up those images. So this, uh, depending on your network connection and what other what images you already have inside Docker downloaded for other work, it could take a little while, which is why we started it now. Is it, are there any other questions before we continue on? Because we're just gonna let this run in the background and come back to it later. All right, so if there's no other questions, we can continue. All right, so big idea. And so this is the big idea of the talk <laughs> is that the techniques of functional programming are defining the next era in software languages. And I'd like to justify that with a series of slides where I walk through the evolution of programming languages. But keep in mind, the point of this is that now the next era of coding of software languages is going to be defined by these techniques that come from functional programming. So let's walk through the, um, the different, the evolution that languages have gone through. So when I did my senior project for my undergraduate degree, my senior project involved writing code in assembly. And when you're writing code in assembly, you're actually listing out the instructions that the central processing unit is going to be executing. So you're doing things that a central processing unit can do like copy bytes from RAM into your local memory, um, perform a specific operation that the CPU knows about, jump to a new location in your code execution. There's some support for conditional. So based on the value in a register, either jump to this location or jump to another location. Very low level, very close to the hardware. That's how, all programming was done uh, at, at one point, but then along came what was then known as high level languages. Now, today we might not think of C and Fortran and some of these other very procedural languages, you might not think of them as high level, but at the time it was huge. And when you have something like a compiler or an interpreter that can take a high level language, which where 
we write code that is human readable where we can define variables rather than having to track memory locations and register values, where we can define data types where the compiler will ensure that the data that we're accessing, that really is a string, it's not a Boolean, where we can have for loops and if then and else branching. Those were a huge advance for, advancement forward. And that was, all of that was based on procedural programming. So the industry did that for about a decade or so. Then along came these ideas from academia called object-oriented. And most of us have lived in this world of object-oriented programming where it has just become natural and assumed that this is uh, how you do software development. And here's just some examples of languages that use that. C++ was an example, Objective-C was an example, and there were others. But the idea there was that you could define classes and then have instances of those classes we, there were the pillars of object-oriented programming, like encapsulation, inheritance, polymorphism, interfaces. Then there was this idea of templates where we could write general purpose code. So this cost us a little bit, meaning that there's a bit of a trade-off. And that is true with each of these steps. Assembly was very efficient Did you, at, at runtime. Of course, it was very difficult to code. Procedural was a little less efficient because we have a little bit of overhead. Object orientation, having all these classes, a little bit more overhead, but we get value from it, which I'll talk about in just a moment. And that same principle applies when we get into the runtime, the um, hosted, uh, managed execution phase, the languages like Java and .NET, or, or VB.NET, C Sharp, and um, F Sharp. And in this case, we write this high level code, and these are all object oriented, of course but they run inside a virtual machine, meaning our code gets compiled down to what would kind of be like an assembly code for a virtual machine that could run on any environment. And the advantage of that is that we get these runtime services. So things like garbage collection, where that we didn't have when we were doing C++ or Objective-C programming. We had to remember, we had to keep track of which memory we had allocated and then make sure that we remember to free that up. If we run inside a virtual machine, the virtual machine can give us some of these services and free up the memory that we no longer need. It can check and make sure that when I'm, when I'm accessing the, the 11th element of an array, it can check to make sure that that's not only a, a length 10 array, that do that bounds checking. Reflection is a huge advantage of this managed execution for Java and C Sharp, Sharp, C -sharp in that your code can look and get information about code. Um, reflection has enables all kinds of capabilities. We have just-in-time compilation. Um, that's more about getting runtime performance, generics. All these features make programming much more productive, but and again, it, it's going to cost a little bit. But the advantage, the reason that we could do this, the reason that we could make this trade-off now is because machines were getting faster and we were um, getting more RAM uh, that would enable that. Well, the same thing is happening now in that we have some new ideas that are making their way in sometimes into existing languages like C++ that was adding object-oriented coding into C. And um, the same thing is happening in Java and C Sharp in that they're getting some language features that support functional programming. Scala and F Sharp are languages that are built around these functional concepts. The one that we're going to focus on today is that first one that's listed there, immutability. Expressions isn't a new concept. Uh, all In all these different stages of programming, you could have expressions, but um, with functional programming, you prefer expressions over statements. And the difference is that expressions return a value. Uh, there's support for what's known as pattern matching, for composition, for currying. These are other ideas that come out of functional programming. Let's go through this evolution again and talk about what motivated each of these. So again, at the assembly level, we interact with CPU, RAM, and other devices. We, when we're talking about procedural coding, what we're doing is we're setting up a series of instructions, but at a little bit higher level than you would do at assembly. With object-oriented coding, we think less about a series of instructions, do this, then do this, do this. We model our co code as a series of objects which have state meaning they have properties that can be changed and methods that could run that would probably change the internals, the state of those objects. That's the object-oriented programming. At managed execution, the, the uh, emphasis is on running within that virtual machine, as I already discussed. 
So the question is, what about what's new here? What's what's the emphasis of this new coding paradigm called functional? And the emphasis is focus on transforming state with a series of functions. We want to think about our program, you know, not just as a series of procedural steps, which we may end up sometimes having, not as a collection of objects, which we may end up having, or and and we certainly most of the time will be running inside of managed execution. But the focus, the emphasis, is thinking about our code as data, as state that is transformed by a series of functions. And sometimes our code ends up looking something like a state machine. So why this shift? So we've talked about what the emphasis was, but why was that, what motivated that shift? The motivation for procedural is very clear. We wanted to abstract away the details of the hardware. That was too low level. The motivation for that object oriented era is that it helps us to organize a huge amount of code into smaller reusable components. Like if I could just get this little part working well, this class, if I could define this class well, and then define this class well, now I'll be able to piece them together and build up something larger and larger. And this works especially well for user interfaces, desktop user interfaces in particular. Managed execution, why was that shift? Well, because we wanted to provide helpful cross-platform runtime services. When Java made managed execution mainstream, their mantra was write once, run everywhere, because they could host it on all these different platforms. So that was the emphasis then. So why are we, what's motivating this shift towards functional? The answer is, and you may or may not have been expecting this, the answer is it improves our ability to reason about correctness, right? One of the big challenges of writing software today is trying to get it right, trying to build something that has high quality and can will run reliably and, and can be maintained well. And the argument is being made that these techniques from functional programming help enable that. It improves our ability to reason about correctness. So what's, what's the big idea that I'm, I'm evangelizing here about is that the techniques of functional programming are defining the next era in software languages. And the reason why is it makes it easier to reason about correctness. Now I want to justify that. I want to give you a, a specific example of why a functional technique and immutability in particular makes it easier to reason about correctness. I'll get to that in a moment. So F sharp is one of those new languages it's designed around this functional style. Uh, it works on the .NET platform, just like Java works on the JVM platform. Um, it's functional first, meaning that the language was designed with these functional concepts. You can still write procedural code. You can still write object-oriented code. You can still take advantage of runtime services, but the language itself was designed for functional. It's cross-platform, uh, Windows, Mac, Linux. General purpose, it's not just for you know, mathematical applications, and it is open source. It's um, no longer controlled solely by Microsoft. So let's talk about immutability and use F sharp as the um, as an example of this immutability. So what do we mean? Maybe I should take a breath <laughs> and see if there's any questions or discussion. I've been I've been going for a little bit. If not, I'm happy to continue on, but I do want to emphasize that I welcome interaction here. All right, what is immutability then? Immutability, once data is initialized, it cannot be modified. That's, that's kind of interesting, right? Because And it kind of goes against the object-oriented approach where I initialize an instance of a class, I initialize this object, and then I can call methods on it and call uh, and change the properties to change the data that's inside that class. And functional kind of says, well, wait a minute, maybe that adds some complication. It's very convenient, very easy, but that might add some complication that makes it more difficult to reason about the correctness of our code. And so immutability says once data is initialized, it cannot be modified. And so, you know, I was explaining this to someone one time and they said, that doesn't make any sense. Like, suppose I'm just writing a game with a rocket ship and uh, this rocket ship has a certain velocity and acceleration and all that. How does that work? I mean, I need to be able to change the velocity, acceleration, position of this rocket ship. And the answer is, well, what you do is you make a copy of the data 
with the changes applied. Make a copy of the data with the changes applied. So you have a piece of data that represents the position and the velocity and the acceleration of the rocket ship. And if you, as your game is progressing, what you do is you make another, you make a copy of that with the changes applied. Now, the first question you might have will be, well, that sounds really uh, um, inefficient. And, you know, to be honest, it, it is a little less efficient than going in and making changes directly in a data structure. The, but there's the advantages, right? There's always that trade-off. And so the trade-off with immutability is that we're able to reason about correctness. So let me give you an example where you probably have already seen this and that you can relate to. This is an example um, from the documentation for Java and it's for the string class which you know, represents any text. And notice here it says strings are constant, meaning that they're immutable. And there it says their values cannot be changed after they are created. That's exactly what we're talking about. C Sharp's string class works exactly the same way. String buffers support mutable strings. So they're saying that there's an alternative and both Java and C Sharp have an alternative for that. But notice this last sentence. This is where I was really driving. Because string objects are immutable, they can be shared. And what that really gets to is the fact that you can share a string from one method to another method or from a function to a function. You can share this string throughout your code without having to worry about some other code changing its value unexpectedly. In other words, because the string class guarantees immutability, then we're able to reason about this and say, ah, there's a bug, there's a whole set of bugs that I don't have to worry about because nothing is going to inadvertently change this string uh, without, without me realizing it. And that's what we're talking about. We just take it from the simple string example, which is, you can think of as kind of like a value and we just apply it to an entire data structure as, and treat it as a value. Let me give you an example from the string class in Java. If you, look at the to uppercase method on the string class, you'll see the text in the documentation says it converts all the characters in this string to uppercase. Well, that's not totally accurate. It doesn't convert any of the characters in this string to uppercase. What it does is it returns you a whole new string where all the characters have been converted to uppercase. And that's what we do in as often as we can in functional programming. Now, just like when high level languages first came along and you realize, hey, this isn't running fast enough. I'm gonna to have to write some assembly code. You could do that. I mean, in uh, functional languages, if you find somewhere where immutability is just a, a the advantage, the, this, the inefficiencies outweigh the advantages, then you can fall back and use immutable, uh, use mutable techniques. And uh, that's perfectly acceptable if necessary. We just prefer immutability. All right, lots of talk. Here's a blue slide. This is a chance for you to open up in your browser, try fsharp.org, and we'll see an example of immutability firsthand using the F Sharp language. So try fsharp.org, and I will paste that into the chat. Oops, let's see. Oops, I see there are some chats. Um, please let us know if it's uh, absolutely need input and link. All right. So there is the link to try F sharp. And as you might expect during a demo. It's try.fsharp. Oh, there you go. So I had the link wrong. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. I'll put that in the chat. Yeah, OK. Well, it's too late. I already did it. No. All right, so try.fsharp.org. That's lame. I probably had my slide wrong, didn't I? Nope, I had it right. Ah, it was just the link in the slide is wrong, but the text on the slide is correct. So let's look at an example of this. In F Sharp, you can create a label. You could almost think of it as defining a variable. What you're doing is defining a value and giving it a label here. The value is three, and I want to refer to that value with the label X. And in F sharp, there's a print FN function. 
almost hearkening back to C days. And it expects, um, what are the placeholders? It's a placeholder and a type specifier. Percent D is for integers. And then I could say, I want to print out the value X like so. So no surprises there in how that works. Hold on. Hopefully that to exit full screen, which I assume you can see will go away there. All right, so that, so we see a couple of things here. There's a let keyword in F sharp. And also, unlike a lot of languages, whenever you're calling a function, you don't use parentheses. That was kind of weird for me at first. Like usually you would do something like, like this. And in F sharp, this is kind of different. This is a tuple, it's considered a single value. And so a lot of times, in F sharp, we don't end up with parentheses or around the arguments to your function. So the way it works is you have a function and then you just list the arguments one after another. All right, now try this. And this, this isn't going to work. Uh, it will look like correct code, but it's not going to work as we intend, but it, we'll use it as a, as a learning exercise. So do X equals X plus one, meaning I want, my intention when writing that might be to increment x, but you'll notice that if you run that code now, I still get out the value of three. And you'll also notice there's a green squiggly there and a message down here. I guess that message is the same. So I can just look down here. The result of this equality expression has type bool. And is it implicitly discarded? So I'll, don't tell anybody I said this, but I kind of wish F sharp hadn't used the equal for both assignment here on line one. So that's assigning a value to a label and as a uh, equality comparison. So I kind of wish F sharp had done this, but it didn't, but that's what's going on. So this line two is actually saying, is X equal to X plus one? It's not actually incrementing. So in F sh sharp, the assignment operator is this little left pointing arrow where you're saying, I want to do X plus one and set it and store the value in X. Actually, I was reminded yesterday that Pas is it Pascal was a language that used that as the assignment operator. So different languages have tried different assignment operators. Now we're getting a red squiggly and this is kind of the point, this value is not mutable. So what we've learned through this exercise is that I've set, I've, I've created this label X, assigned it the value three, and now I can't change it because by default, values are immutable in F sharp. Now I could, I could do that. I could add a, a type a modifier here and uh, add the mutable keyword and that would say that I would like for X to be mutable. And then this code would actually run as intended. But as you start writing more functional code, you'll look at that and say, mm, whoever wrote this couldn't figure out how to do this in the functional way. So we uh, generally uh, avoid that kind of thing. But the point is, is that by default, um, values are immutable. Any questions or discussion about that? Your function print fn, should yes. it be, shouldn't it return something? That is a very good question. And um, this one, it does return something. And you're exactly right. I can mouse over it. And um, it looks like. It returns t, which is x, right? I'm going to go with it returns unit. Okay. Unit is kind of like void. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it return it doesn't return anything here. Okay. Um, so yeah, good, good, good call out. It does return. I shouldn't say that. It does return something. What it returns is the value unit. Yep, good one. 
All right. We can do uh, in F sharp, you can do more than just integers, of course. Oh, also notice that X is being inferred as an int. And the reason it's being inferred to be an int is because it that label is an integer itself. If I put a dot there, then that becomes a float. And then the next line of code fails to compile because printfn, because this, the function returned by printfn percent d is expecting an integer. Remember, we saw that with the mouse over. Now this function is expecting a float, which is would be an f. That's um, kind of a side point. Uh, it doesn't really have to do with immutability. It just gets to the point that f sharp is inferring types. I didn't have to say that that was an integer. All right, but that's a side point. The other thing that we need to know, well, let me see. Let me see if I covered everything in the sides. Okay, so yeah, so F sharp records is next. So besides just integers, sometimes what we'll want to do is have a collection of values that um, are grouped together into uh, a record, into a, into a value that includes more than one basic uh, underlying type. So maybe what I would want to do is something like this, and there'll be a lot of errors as I'm typing, but um, maybe I want to say that we're having a workshop. So that's tonight. We're having a workshop tonight. And the name of the workshop is F sharp and immutability, like so. And we have some number of in attendees and looking over at Slack, uh, where's my little, there's looks like 11, no, or 10. So we have some number of attendees. And, you know, uh, I'm getting red. I'll talk about the red squigglies in a second, but this looks a lot like how you might, um, you know, assign JavaScript in Python or any other languages. I guess this would be like a dictionary. It's kind of like a dictionary. It's kind of like JavaScript or Python dictionary. The red squiggly says that um, this key is not found. So this is referred to as a F sharp record, an instance of a ref F sharp record. But in order to do that, I need to define what I mean by, I need to define a type that has those fields. And so I use the type keyword and then specify that the workshop is going to consist of a name, which is a string and a list of attendees, attendees, which is an int. And now all my, now all my problems have gone away. Okay. So this is like, this lines four through eight, it's kind of like defining a class. It's, it's an, defining an F sharp record type. And then 10 through 14 defines an instance of it. And notice again, just like when I said, let X equals three, I didn't have to say that X was an integer. Here, I don't have to say that this variable workshop or X, I could just name it uh, because I commented out X up here, I could name it X here. So now the label X is assigned to this value, which includes these two fields. So in F sharp, that's how you define um, records. You have to have a type definition and then there's the instance. Now the same thing with records, uh, I can't do something like this. Or I mean, I could, but that becomes a Boolean expression. Like uh, that would be something like um, uh, has 11 attendees, right? Because the, the equal without, without the let, the equal just becomes a comparison operator. I cannot even, and again, I could try to assign it like so, but then it says that this field is, is not mutable. The point again is that by default, we're embracing immutability. Any questions or comments about that? Sometimes your record instances um, can, sometimes they can fit on a single line. So I'll shrink down so that they will fit on a single line and you can do things, you can put them on a single line with a semicolon dividing them. So probably no surprises there. You probably would have been able to guess that you could do that. So semicolon separating the fields or just put them on separate lines. 
The tabs and dints are important in F-sharp, just as they are in Python. All right, F-sharp records. So the F-sharp records combine multiple values, like name and attendees. And then if we have an instance of them, you, uh, so when defining the record, you have a colon and the type. And then in defining the instance, you have the, the, uh, the field name and then a value. Oh, I should do this real quick back in try F sharp, print F in. Percent A means just call, uh, just print out some reasonable value for that. So uh, print A X now, oops, there we go. Let's see what that looks like. And then it just prints out a version of that record value like so. We'll get to a web application in just a moment. We're just exploring the, uh, the concepts here. Hey, Wallace, there is a mm -hmm. question in the chat. Oh, um, thank you. So like, when do you suggest to set a variable as mutable? So usually what I do is I try not to, I try to write the code in such a way that I don't have to make it mutable. If I find that it's just really awkward, it would be really hard to maintain. Or if I get it running and find that there are performance implications to having to create all these extra objects, then I would switch back to mutable. So those are the two cases. If it's if an implementation is just too awkward or if you end up with uh, performance issues. Good. F-sharp record instances can be defined on multiple lines as we saw or on the same line. Yep, we just saw that. Just making sure that I covered everything I intended and they um, are immutable. So we can't do things like change the values once they're set. And again, the advantage is that we can reason about things. So what have we learned? Let's just, uh, this is the last of the blue slides in this collection. We saw that the let keyword instantiates a value whether that value is a simple native type, like a bool or a car or a text string or um, int or double so forth. Or um, sometimes the values combine multiple values together and that would be like a record. And so we saw examples of that in both cases immutable by default. So then how does that work in practice once we start creating values that we don't change without making a copy. So the way that it works is you end up defining functions that transform your values, that, um, that modify, that return a copy. Just like the string dot to uppercase, you might have, if you wanted to increment the number of people that are registered for a workshop, you might have add registration function. And this, uh, this, syntax here, this sim symbology here, says that this function takes in a workshop instance and returns a new workshop instance. So we would send in the old one and it would increment the number of attendees by one and then return a copy of that workshop. I, you're welcome to try to do this in uh, try F sharp, but I'm gonna go a little bit faster on this one. So you might want to just follow, but let me just show you how I would do that. So I'm going to say add registration and it's going to take in a workshop. And in this case, I'm going to specify that this is a function that takes in a workshop and it, oops, and it returns a workshop. So that would be the way to explicitly say what this function um, takes in and returns. And then what I do is I'll create a new workshop. So I'll do this a little verbose and then show you a shorter way to do it. So this would be my new workshop and it's going to have a name which is the same as my previous workshop. So the name would be the same, but the number of attendees would be the previous number of attendees plus one. And then what my function returns is this new one. So you can see lines 16 through 18 made a copy, made a new copy of the workshop with the fields modified and then return that new one. If I mouse over add registration, then you can see that syntax that I was describing where this function takes a workshop and returns a workshop. And actually, once you, once you get it implemented, 
F sharp um, can start inferring what those types are. So I don't have to explicitly tell it that it returns a workshop. It can, it can infer that from the fact that the, the last expression that I have is what is being returned. Notice there's not a return keyword, in other words. It's whatever's returned last. And really I could, I don't even have to do that in two lines. I mean, I, I, I wrote all that out just to explain what's going on. So this is, this would work as well. And in fact, if we're lucky, I haven't tried this, but F sharp might even be able to infer the type of the W because of how I'm using it. The fact that in my project, there's only one type that has a name field and an attendees field. F sharp is able to infer that that input parameter is a workshop. There's actually, let me show you another way to do this. Um, sometimes your records may have multiple fields and you don't want to just have, and if you only want to change one, there's some special syntax that you can use that would be like so. And this says, um, and sometimes we'll do it something like that maybe or maybe something like this. You can play with the tabs to see what, what works nicely. But this says, this syntax here says, I want a new record. That would be the curly braces. And just use whatever values are in W with this one change. So that's kind of nice. Either one of those works. So that's how you would define an add registration function. And you would call it, when you call it, you would get back a new workshop here. It's equal, we're adding a registration to the existing workshop and we get back a new value. What if I wanted to add registrations plural instead of just incrementing one, I had some kind of an integer. Then the way that that would work is your add registration functions will take multiple parameters. You could take an int, some number of per, uh, new participants. You could take a workshop and then it will return a new workshop. So each one of these gets added on to create a new function. So under the, under the hood, when we call add registrations and pass in an int, it's actually creating a new function that takes a workshop and returns a workshop. So the way to look at this is uh, the last parameter would be the thing that gets returned and then these others are kind of like inputs. So we would pass in a number and a workshop and we'd get back our next workshop. Here's an example of that. So add registrations, plural, have a new number of participants. That's an integer. Here's my new workshop. And now my attendees is W attendees, it's plus P. So now when I call registrations, plural, you can see I'm passing in a five here. Say I'm adding five new attendees. That is kind of different. You know, I came from a long history that included C and C++ and C sharp. So uh, that legacy of um, styles, we probably would have reversed those two. So that, that's kind of weird at first too, when you come to F sharp and I assume other functional programming languages is that usually when you were adding registrations to workshop, our natural tendency would be to list the workshop the first and then the number of registrations. Uh, but when you're chaining together functions like as I'll show you in a moment, we end up, a lot of times those end up being reversed because we want the workshop, the, the main thing to be last, the thing that we're kind of operating on, we want it to come last in the list. And the reason is this, because oftentimes what we want to do is pipeline these functions together. So here, what am I doing? I'm taking a workshop, I'm sending it to a add registration function which takes a workshop and returns a new one. Then I'm sending it to a function that, um, and actually, you know what? I'm going, to, I'm going to edit this on the fly because I see a place where I could have made this better. And so oops, I guess that doesn't really make a big difference. Well, that's kind of ugly, but we'll leave it like that. But I should do the same thing here. This would be better syntax. Or just better symbol here on the slide. 
Okay. So we have a workshop. We're going to add a registration. It takes in a workshop, returns a workshop. Then we're calling this function persist database. So if we're going to persist our workshop data to a database, we need to know how we're accessing the database. So we're going to have something that has, you know, the connection string and what kind of provider it is or whatever, plus the workshop that we're wanting to persist. And then we probably would be kind of convenient for this function to return the workshop. And maybe it's the same one that got passed in, or maybe it's it's read back out of the database, right? That might make sense. But primarily so that we can now send that workshop to a send email update function. So after persisting to the database, we need to notify the organizer and the send email update might need to take in some kind of a client that knows how to send email plus the workshop that we're discussing and then a new copy of the workshop that we're going to get back out. So this is a very common pattern as well to, to, fun, uh, to pipeline a value through a chain of functions. And so there's a operator specifically for this. And in F-sharp, that's the pipe operator. And so this is what it would look like in F-sharp. Our next value for the workshop would be equal to the previous value of the workshop after it's been sent through adding registration to it, after we've persisted it to the database, after we've sent the email update, now we have back what the next workshop is. So this, this is very common and, and this gets to back to that ability to reason about correctness is that each of these functions, none of them are going to modify my previous workshop value or my DB or my SMTP, none of them, none of these functions are going to change anything I pass in. All they're going to do is return a new value. Uh, just to illustrate that this is common, I went and grabbed some code from our code base. And um, this is actual code from Olo code base. I don't see anything proprietary here, so it's safe. But just to illustrate the point that this is actually how you do it, and so I just copied and pasted some code that we have where we take a result and we, we, it's a sequence and we map it through this function and create a list and then pattern map on this. And so uh, we have a, a chain of operations that are performed on values that are passed from one function to another. Can you overload these? Does that even apply? Great question. And the answer is no, you cannot overload. So you'll end up having to come up with clever names for the different um, different uh, functions that take different parameters. Now in F-sharp, you can still create classes with methods and those can be overloaded like you would any other, um, with like you would in most other object-oriented programming language. All right, good question. Thank you for that. Confirm, all right, so back to a blue slide. You may remember a while back, we started a uh, some download of uh, and setup of containers. And if all went well, your Visual Studio code should have this little symbol here. It's an F-sharp symbol uh, over on the left. And when you click on it, you can expand out and see some F-sharp code. So that's the first thing. And I would be happy to help you get through this. You're, even if you want to share your, share your screen, I'd be happy to see if you're having a problem. Maybe somebody else will have a similar problem. But hopefully everybody is at this point. If not, please feel free to jump in and let me know. And then the other thing that should work and I'll have this on the slide and I'll paste it into the chat as well. This should work for you. Where's the chat window? All right. So let me see, can I click, control click? No, nope, I'll just have to open my browser and paste that in. And the first time that this runs, the app does have to warm up, so it'll take a second or two. 
So this is a website that is going to be running on inside the container. So again, not affecting your, your local configuration or setup or anything. So that's very convenient. And um, just a simple little menu with five items. And you can add items to what we call in the, bas uh, in the industry a basket. Um, you might think of it as a cart, but I guess at restaurants, you don't have carts. I don't know, you have baskets. And you can add items to there and there's a little subtotal. And there's some obvious things missing. Milkshake, for example. <laughs> but uh, we also might want to be able to remove items from our basket. And maybe it's not very clear what this total subtotal is down here. So we can improve that. So what we're going to do is go through and edit this website and uh, make some improvements for it. You're, you're going to do that. All of the code for this website is written in F sharp. And so that's that's pretty cool. I mean, it gets transpiled to JavaScript. Um, you know, a lot of languages have that. You can transpile from your preferred language down to JavaScript, and that's what's going on here. So, any questions or comments? Anyone want to describe any problem they're having? If not, I'll assume all's well. By the way, um, there's this little message down here, configuring dev container. It's a little deceiving and maybe I should change that, figure out how to make that a little bit different. But what's really going on is that there's a loop here running on the container and it's just serving the website and monitoring the website. So as you make changes in the F-sharp code, it will automatically recompile and uh, update the page. So that's why it says configuring dev container. All right, let's see what else we have in our plan. So here's your assignment in menu.fs, which again, you look for the ionide extension, which is um, supports F sharp projects. Under the data folder, you should be able to find the menus.fs. Oh, the slide says menu. It looks like it's actually menus, plural. And see if, based on what you've learned so far about F-sharp records, if you can add uh, a new item to the, uh, to the menu. And I will do the same thing. So I encourage you to do it yourself, but um, I will walk through it on the screen here. Looks like menu item that defines the record type. It has the kinds of things you might expect on a menu item. Looks like I have another record type that includes a full menu, which would be a list of menu items. Hopefully my narration isn't distracting you from what you're doing. But this sound, here's the list of items that we see in the menu. So here, I know what I'll do. I'll just copy and paste. And you know, we, we wouldn't be, we won't be able to get into this now, but obviously this would generally come from a database. Notice that it doesn't need a comma between the items in the list. See, so items is a list. The square braces is how you would do a list, just like JavaScript, but you, like, like JSON, but you don't need a comma there. All right, so I, I added that milkshake. Let me see if I jump back over to my website. How did it do? Oh, look at that. I have my milkshake. Can anyone, can anyone affirm me as a presenter and tell me that you've got this working? I do. Thank you. It's magic. <laughs> Great, thanks. I'm glad to hear it. All right, so that's, that's pretty cool. Let's see what else we have. Um, that's adding a record. Um, so that's what 
So what have we done in this set of practice slides? We've edited some existing F-sharp code. We've added an F-sharp record to a list of values. Let's talk just briefly about F-sharp lists. Lists, values, including records, can be grouped into lists. So here on the slide, it looks a lot like that menu we were just editing. Here's a list of workshops. Yeah, so that, that makes sense. The square brace tells you the list and then the curly braces are each record. Lists are immutable too. And that seems very surprising. But if you've ever, if, if, you, if you went through a computer science program in college and you ever had to implement a linked list, then you know that actually that can be implemented very efficiently. And that's why lists are preferred is because we can do things that make, quote unquote, a new copy of a list, it makes it very efficient. So let's, let's just look at this example here. I have a new workshop, F-sharp and list processing. Um, and this is how I prepend an item. So I, I have, it's not shown on this slide, but I had a previous list of workshops. And what I can do is I can say, now I have a new list of workshops, which is equal to the new item I've added, which goes in front of all the others. And that's a very efficient operation because it really it's just a reference to the old, the new item, which is linked to the first item in the old list. So you don't really have to make a copy of all the items in the list. And the reason we don't have to make a copy of all the items in the list is because we know they're immutable. So we don't have to worry about anything changing those. So they're just a set of values that we can continue to use. If you do need to append an item to a list, um, what's happening is that last item, we, we do have to create a new first item and then link, uh, append a list onto the end of that. But again, not as inefficient to create a copy of a linked list as you might expect. What's nice about F-sharp lists is that they can be used in a pipeline. I'm sorry, what was the difference between the, the two? The, Here? Yeah, between the prepend and append? Yes, so on the append, the new workshop that we're oh, adding. I see, I see, yes, 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 it's a whole list. I'm so sorry, yes, got it. Good, yeah, great. So F-sharp lists can be processed in a pipeline. And this is very common, again, not just for, for you know, showing what F-sharp can do, but when we're writing code, we do this. So we'll take a list of workshops and that becomes a parameter to a function. Remember this pipeline, it says, we take this list of workshops and we send it to a function. And what function do we send it to? We send it to the function that's on this line, which starts with sort by descending. But this function takes another parameter, which is a selector, which is a function itself. It's like an anonymous function, an arrow function, a lambda expression. Different languages call them different things. But um, the fun is an F-sharp keyword. And then um, we can get each item in the list, which is the W, and then select and say, I'm interested in attendees. This can be uh, a little awkward if you, don't, if you haven't been programming in a language that supports this kind of thing. But if you have, it's, it's probably familiar. Here, the important thing is that we can chain all these together. So we sort by descending, then we take the first three, then we, we map our list, we take the elements in our list and convert them into something else. And in this case, it's just simply pulling out the name. And then we're taking each of those items and iterating and sending it to a function that knows how to print a string. So we're going to do this in just a moment in our website so that you can get a practice with it. So I'll show you another example of that. But uh, I do want to just, again, I said this in words, but uh, just here's some pictures of it. This thing right here is called a Lambda expression in, um, in .NET. It has other names in other languages. And it's just, uh, it's just a shorthand function. I, I could have defined a separate function that does the same thing and given it a name and then put the name there. But most of the time we'll do this. The fun is a keyword. You get a variable with, which, recommend, which represents the incoming argument for your unnamed function here. And then the arrow to you return what it is that you want to return. All right, so let's, let's try that. 
you'll notice that in your website, we have a basket and the items uh, are listed there. And the order, I think in, in the case, I, in my case, I mean, in the default case, what is it? Is it uh, anything you add? Yeah, it looks like anything you add goes to the top of the list. Personally, I kind of would like for the items to be in a more logical order, meaning that I, I mean, you could do it either way. You could continue doing them in the order that they, you could reverse it. So it's the order that they're added. For this example, let's try to put them in a logical order so that the foos burgers are always on top, milkshakes are always on the bottom and everything else is in between. So the way that we would do that is we would go back to our code and um, I might, I might uh, click around a little bit to remember where this is. I know it's in my slides. Well, let me, just to be consistent, let me make sure I'm doing it in the same place where the slides say to do it. In baskets.fs, find the add function and sort the items in the next basket. Okay, so I'll do that in Visual Studio Code. So here's baskets, here's add. So my add function takes a previous basket and then the item I'm wanting to append to it it creates the new basket item. Each, each item in the basket needs to have its unique ID because each you're going to have multiple foos burgers in there. Then we create a whole new basket, which is the previous basket with these changes, where the items in the new basket is defined by the items in the previous basket, but appending the new basket item. So what I want to do now is I want to pipe that to a sort by, and that to the sort by, and now I need a function that knows what to sort by. And the most succinct way to do that is with a Lambda expression where I take I don't know, the item maybe, I think it would be I for item. So it's a function that takes an item and it says what it is that I'm wanting to sort by. And in my case, I'm going to use ID. You know, maybe our menu items have a logical uh, order on them, assigned to them. For simplicity here, we'll just use the ID because that is the, that's the logical order. So I make that change. I think I save it and switch back. Wait, let me leave this on the screen just in case, make sure everybody's got it. And once you have that, you should be able to switch back and see the change reflected in the website. I'm hoping that that works for everyone. Please let me know. Oh, mine isn't working the way I would have thought. So maybe I have a bug. So that's embarrassing. Let me think about this. Ah, oh, I see what my bug is. Does anyone see? This is a good learning exercise. Return next basket instead of um, the adjusted basket maybe? Uh, good, yes, it's a good call out. So there on line 26, I'm returning the next basket, which I've instantiated here on lines 20 through 25. So, but that's not a bug. That, that, that all looks good. There's something else that I've done wrong. Something wrong with the way I'm sorting the items. And, and maybe it's not clear because the intention. So I'm sorting by ID, which is the ID of the basket item, which is just a random number. That's not what I intended. What I intended was to sort by the menu items ID. So that my hamburgers will have one particular ID, they'll be at the top. My milkshake will have a different ID, it'll be at the bottom. So I was basically sorting them in a random order previously. So let's see if that works. Yep, that's what I intended. please give me some encouragement that this is working for you or let me know how we can help. That works. Thank you, Mark.
All right. Let's continue on. Um, yeah, so I have the correct code here. That looks good. All right, so let's see what we've done so far. We've done all of this and focused on immutability of both just values of records of lists. Now let's talk about the really exciting part, model view update, model view update. So what is model view update? Let's talk about the model, the view and the update. The model in the model view update is the state of your component. In our case, our application is simple enough that it'll be the state of the entire application, but generally each of your components on your UI, whether it's a web, uh, web application or desktop application or mobile application, each of the components will have their own model or their state. In fact, I think we use those terms interchangeably in the code. It'll have some, it'll have a way to render that given state. So that's the view, no surprises there. And then it'll have an update. And this is where it gets to the immutability part. Notice it says the update gets a new copy of the state after some event. So it really starts to you, you treat your state, as I mentioned before, almost like a state machine where events are transforming your state. So that's what the model view update stands for. What are the advantages of this? Of the model view update approach to building user interfaces is that it's compatible with immutability, meaning that we're able to reason about the correctness of not only our business logic, but now the correctness of our user interface. And it, thanks to React, it works really nicely for web applications. All right, so let's see what, let's go into this in some more detail. So in a model view, in an application or a component that uses model view update, you're gonna have some model, which is represents the state of your application. So let's just consider this application. What is the state of my application here? Actually, it's going to be my basket. Right now, the things in my basket, that would be sufficient for defining my state. I think in my, when I wrote the application, I included our menu and maybe who the brand was so that it could be, you know, multi-tenant kind of thing. You could or could not use a subtotal. Uh, you could just calculate that as part of the view. That depends on how you want to handle that. But that's the way you think about your applications. What is the state of my application? Then, I'm sorry, when I alt tab back, it, I lose my presentation mode. Um, then we have a um, render function which creates a view of that model. The user would interact with that view. And when they interact with that view, that will dispatch some, there's events that occur that dispatch messages. And then those messages trigger the update of your state. So the model gets transformed based on the events that have happened and we get a new model, which is then rendered back to the view. So this is the, the mental model and then how we organize the code for model view update. Sometimes when you're doing the update, there may be some asynchronous things that need to happen. And so sometimes the update itself will dispatch future messages, other messages, or maybe future messages. And so sometimes there'll be a loop there. And you can imagine like you load a page and that will render an empty menu. And then dynamically, you're going to go pull the menu. So the update would need to go Go get the menu, would say, go get the menu. And then when that menu comes down, then another update would be, a message will be sent saying that here's the, the full menu. And then that becomes part of the model. And then that gets rendered. So you may have a little bit of loop there as the application works dynamically. One particular implementation of this model view update is, is called Elmish. Uh, and it comes from the Elm libraries or the Elm language. A collection of tools. And it, when you're um, using this Elmish pattern or approach implementation for model view update, you end up with three functions. You end up with an init function, which and I'm using the syntax that we're familiar with now. It takes unit, which means it doesn't take anything. It takes um, just a pair of parentheses, almost like a void, and it returns the initial state. So you have an init function. You have a render function which takes a state and then something that knows how to send messages. And what it does is it returns a view. 
And the reason that the render function needs to take a dispatcher, which is the thing that knows how to send messages, the reason it needs to is because imagining you're, imagine you're rendering to HTML and you need to have an on-click event for a button. But when you click on the button, you need to have some way of sending that message that the button has been clicked. That's why that dispatcher comes in in the render function. And then the third function that you need when you're using the Elmish approach is to you have an update function, which takes a message, the kinds of things that could happen in your application, and it takes a state and returns a new state. So I think the init and the render is pretty clear. I'm going to jump back over to my web page and think about this message state and state. So what are the kinds of things that can happen here in my application? Well, right now there's only one thing, right? There's only one button. We're gonna add some more in a moment. But the message that can be sent in my application currently is that I'm adding a menu item to the basket. So that's, uh, and then whenever that message is sent, it updates the state, it updates the basket. Uh, let's jump back into the blue slides. So the question for you, going back to Visual Studio Code, do you see the model view update in the code? And you will. <laughs> I've purposely, I've organized it so there's a model.fs, a view.fs, and an update.fs. And then the app.fs is what puts all three of those together. Because you'll remember I, that um, when you're using Elmish, you'll end up with three functions, an init function, an update function, and a render function. So let's see, do we want to explore? So let's explore that while I'm, I'll do it on the screen here. So let, let's look at each one of these. So there's the model.fs. Yeah, so as I mentioned, the state of our application includes the menu and the basket. Here, the message, here's a list of messages that can be sent through my application. There's one right now, add item. We're going to add a remove item in just a moment. And then there's an init function which knows how to initialize the state. It knows how to get the sample menu and then how to set the basket to an empty list. Let's look at the view. The view is a little more uh, complex and it could probably be an entire workshop all on its own. But um, just to get the big picture, you can see that we're rendering each individual part of the application. The way that F Sharp works, and I haven't mentioned this yet, but it, you can, in F Sharp, you can only call functions that are already defined. There's no way to predefine the signatures of functions. So you usually, in understanding it, a lot of times I'll jump down to the bottom and work my way back up because all that render can do is call functions that are defined above it. But uh, render, you can see here, it takes a state. It takes a thing that knows how to send messages. And what does it return? It returns, let's see here, it returns a React element. And again, probably worth an entire workshop on its own. The important thing is that it returns something that can be rendered into HTML by the React JavaScript libraries. And in fact, all of these do. You can see each one of them re return a React element. That's the view. And then the last one, oops, back onto the ionide extension is the update. And so it takes a message, a previous state, and it returns a new state. And when it gets the message, it says, well, what, what kind of message is this? This is an add item message. And it goes through and creates the next state, which would be um, the previous state, but with a, a new basket. So one of the things we're going to do at the end is be able to add the ability to remove items. Uh, before we do that, um, jump over to the instructions and we can post these in the chat. And we have already gone through and done the workshop setup. And now we, and we've already added milkshake to our list of menu items. And we've already sorted the items in the basket. So let's jump down to number three. Can you prefix the subtotal with the text subtotal? All right, so I will keep the instructions up on the screen here and do that myself. 
Let's see here. Try to do it uh, on your own and I will do it on the screen as well. So let's see where it says, where the subtotal is, we wanna prefix the word subtotal. So that would probably be in the view. And it looks like that would be in render basket items. Hmm. Oh, here we go. So here is where we're defining the elements of this React, uh, this portion, this React element. And if I say subtotal, like so, that will be, this is where it's formatting out the subtotal. So I think that, that that's probably all we need to do. Save it and jump back over. And I see that it reloaded. Oh yeah. And you can see right there, it says subtotal colon. Right. Any questions about that? I'm going to just continue on and hope. Let me know if you have questions. Want me to slow down? We could also make that subtotal bold. And so that's right there where we added subtotal. You can see that that text has it has it's right aligned. What could we do here? Is there a bold? Yeah, has text weight bold. And let me see. Oh, yep, I got bold there. Let me, so that worked for me. Let me put the instructions and my code back up. So that was just setting the style of this block. This one's, this next one's a little interesting. Hide the subtotal if the basket is empty. Hmm, hide the subtotal. All right, so right now the app, it shows a subtotal zero and doesn't have anything in, in it very interesting. But if we look down at the render basket function definition, Render basket, there's the render basket. It's calling um, render basket items. And what I'd like to do here is add some logic that determines whether or not I call the function render basket items, or maybe I call the function render empty basket. You see, I've got two I've, on line 79, render basket items on line 98 render empty basket. And what's what's nice about this is you can just put if else statements in here. So let's let's see if the basket, oops, fat fingered that. If the basket dot items, is there a length? Uh, length is equal to zero. Um, then I want to render an empty basket. And notice render empty basket, it's nothing but HTML. So it doesn't need any, any parameters. So it just takes unit, which is a pair of empty parentheses. Otherwise else render basket items. Now that's, that's pretty nice. Let's see if that works. I'll put the code back in a second. Let me just double check that I got it right. Oh yes, I did. So my basket's empty. So it says nothing. What are you looking forward to? Nothing yet. But once we start adding items, that goes away. So there, there's the code. So if, remember that the single equal sign, that's the comparison operator, the equality operator in F sharp. So that's, that's really nice. Anyone? Any comments, challenges, questions? All right, let's try number six. Add a remove button to each basket item. So continuing in view.fs, find the render basket item singular. 
So we've got render basket items and then render basket item. And let's just look at what this is doing. This is creating a list item. Bulma is a CSS library. So it's just a convenience um, way of applying styles uh, to things using, uh, instead of a div with a Bulma columns um, uh, style uh, class name, uh, this uh, Bulma is just, a, this class is just the F-sharp convenience for not having to include both of those. But let's see, so find the column that displays the line item and then add a new column. So I already have one column to display the line item. What I wanna do now is put in a new column that has a button in it. So I'll have the items on the left and then a column of all the, of a button to remove the item. Let's see, do we have some, ah, you know what? We're just gonna copy and paste this code and study it, add this column, yep. And let's see, what is this? Value is not a function and cannot be applied. Oh. It's because you're misaligned. Yep, thank you. So what was going on there is F sharp thought I was calling a column function that took this argument and then it looked like I was trying to pass another argument to it because that was indented. Ah. So, but now that it's, aligned, that would be a new column. So let's see, does that, oh, nice. So now I have, oh, it doesn't do anything yet. We'll take care of that in a moment, but at least we have the UI there for the remove button. Okay, back to the instructions. Uh, so, so far we have a UI, but what we don't have yet is an on click event. So let's just copy and paste that to the button. So here I'm defining the button. The button has the uh, is small class. It's is light color. It's using these uh, font awesome class names. So the other thing that I need to do is say that when this button is clicked, here is the function that will be called. And the function is calling the dispatch function, which you'll remember takes a message and sends it through the system. What I've pasted in is a remove item method message, but you'll remember that there is no remove item. There was just an add item. So once you paste that in, let me, I'm going to expand this and the messages that we send are back in the model. So you'll want to jump over to the model where there's a list of messages and add another one for remove item. And when I'm sending this message, I, I need to say, I mean, I could just send a message that's empty that doesn't require any uh, parameters. But in this case, I need to know exactly which item I'm removing. And in this case, it's a basket item, which you'll remember is identified by a good. So that's what we need. And so now when we come back here, um, this is still underlined. I'm guessing it's just because the compiler hasn't caught up yet. So let's assume that. Um, uh, why do we need to assume that? We don't need to assume that. What is... Um, well, let's just see if it... It still won't work because... Nope, we've got something else going on. So the, do we have another learning opportunity here? I added remove item. I spelled it correctly. You know, I, I tried retyping it and it, that fixed it for me. I don't know if it's a bug in the uh, editor. Oh, retyping this? Yeah, that, that fixed it for me. You're right, thank you. So it looks like it was a bug in the compiler from when I pasted it in. Good. All right, 
Um, I think I might, looks like I need to reload the website. It may not have been able to dynamically recover from that compile error. It still isn't removing because while I am sending the message, I, the Elmish uh, infrastructure is actually sending the message, but my update function, which updates the state, isn't handling that message yet. And you can see that on the in the update.fs. In fact, let me close it. Maybe that'll help because I'm expecting, there we go. Inside the update.fs, when I'm handling all the cases, this is this match is it's like a, a switch case statement thing that you might have in other languages. There's an underline there and it says that I am uh, may in incomplete pattern matching. Oh yeah, for example, the value remove item may indicate a case that's not covered by the pattern. So that's kind of nice. I'm getting a warning that here I'm handling these messages, but I'm not, I'm not handling the one to remove an item where it's the basket item ID. And, you know, again, we could type this. Let me show you, uh, in case you want to come back and do this later and want to see the solution. If you go to the very end of the instructions, you will find uh, that if you look at the commits on the solution branch, you can see the suggested solutions. So here are each steps, each, here are a commit per instruction. So there's the one for prefixing subtotal with, uh, with the text, bolding the subtotal, hiding if it's empty, adding the remove button, and then lastly, the ability to remove items from the basket. So you can click there and see what we need to change. So there's adding the message to remove the item. And then here's the code for the update function. And let's look at this a little bit. So yeah, we're creating a new basket where the basket, the basket um, module has on it, it knows how to remove it has added all the logic for removing a particular basket item. So that gives me the new basket. And then I create the new state, which is the previous state, but with this new basket. And, you know, as I mentioned before, you don't have to explicitly do that. And you would never see that in real code. It's just kind of convenient for learning. So I think that that should make this more functional. So I'm adding items. Yep. And so now we can remove items. So imagine having, imagine trying to implement this. Um, I mean, just in plain JavaScript, maybe that's not a fair comparison. But compare this at least to plain JavaScript, what would that take and how would you maintain that? I mean, it would be, it would be, um, it'd be challenging to make sure you got it right with this structure, with embracing immutability and the constraints that it creates and using the model view update pattern, which is based on immutability, that gives us the ability to write code that is easier to reason about and about the correctness of it. Now, granted, the F# -sharp syntax may be completely foreign, and it it does there's a little bit of a learning curve there. But once you get past that learning curve, it really opens up a lot of um, possibilities for it, realizing the benefits of this approach. I'm going to wrap things up here with some closing comments. So, when you're finished playing with this. Um, and if you want to completely clean things up, what you can do is uh, exit from Visual Studio Code and then go into the Docker desktop and just delete uh, the containers that are there, um, delete the images that you don't need. Those are all documented in the slides. All of these slides are also available in the GitHub repository. So you, it's in PDF format. So you also have this as a reference. 
So let me know, did we accomplish the objectives? Are you, did I convince you? Are you motivated to adopt functional techniques in whatever language you're using? Just start thinking about coding in a, maybe in a different way. Um, could you describe the MVU pattern to someone else, the model view update, the fact that we have this state that um, we're creating a copy of the state with the changes and then that gets rendered each time. Notice, maybe I should point this out too. Notice that I'm changing the state of things. The whole page isn't being re-rendered. So I don't wanna give that impression. Behind the, scene, what's behind the scenes, what's going on is React is identifying which portions of the page need to change. And so only a small, only the portions of the page that need to change are being updated here. So I don't wanna give the impression that you're having to re-render the entire UI. And now you have some experience with editing F-sharp code. I can certainly, if you followed along and been doing it, then I can certainly um, know that you have that. I would welcome any follow-on questions right now or later as you're working through this. I hope to hear from you. So um, let me open the floor. Any, any comments from the participants, questions or comments? I'm kind of curious from your experience. Um, you know, C sharp is going more functional. There's there's actually a really good book that lets you get really functional with C sharp. Um, it's by Enrico Buonanno, um, but it was a great book that kind of lets you really adapt even more functional concepts of C sharp. So I'm kind of curious from your your experience. When would you still use C sharp versus F sharp, or do you kind of always use F sharp at this point? Right, so a lot of it will depend on where, you know, your team. So I'm fortunate, I mean, one of the reasons that I went to Olo is because they were advertising the need for F-sharp and I really wanted to do the F-sharp coding. And so I'm on a team where that's any new, any new code is all in F-sharp. We have legacy code and I'm not, I'm sorry, we have our existing um, golden code base. And uh, that is, a lot of that is in C-sharp. And if I, if you go in and edit existing C sharp code, you want to follow the style that's there. Of course, if you have new components, then I would do what you described, Mark. If I was, if I had to write in C sharp, I would definitely use the new functional capabilities that are add, being added to C sharp, and use a more um, a functional approach. In fact, uh, we are editing one of our applications that's been around the longest. We are adding new functionality to it. It's a web application built on jQuery and any new functionality that goes into that, it, we're using what you saw here. We're using React, um, embedding React components into this old jQuery application. And it's all, um, all the React components are generated from F-sharp code. So sometimes you have that ability to even on some, working on some legacy code to use um, either Scala for J, J, Java or F-sharp for .NET. Great, thanks. Very nice job. I, I love the MVU pattern now. <laughs> mm -hmm. Good, I'm glad. Anyone else? Yeah, I'm a software engineer in test, and uh, I took this because they said that there are tests are in it. So this is a really good intro because I've been doing object oriented in Specflow for so long that I'm. It was like it's a good change of pace for me. So like I'm always excited to learn something new. And um, this wasn't as daunting as I thought it was going to be. Great <laughs> intro. <laughs> Thanks, Thank Wallace. You, I, I really do appreciate it. Thank you, Don. I appreciate you being here and participating. I see some comments here. I've been doing OOP for a long time. Um, yeah, it's that was a mind me. shift. Yep, that was you. <laughs> And thanks a lot coming from Python. It helps me understand what happens behind the scenes. Good. Yeah, Python has a lot of uh, ability to support functional programming as well. All right, Kate, what's the next? Uh, are, we, are we finished or did we have some wrap up to close things out? Um, yeah, if you wanna... Uh... Let me share my screen. Sure. Um, just wanted to pull up 
Connect to this slide again. Um, and um, yeah, this is um, a great way to get in touch with Home New Code. And uh, so I wanted to give another shout out to Olo. You know, um, lots of great opportunities for hiring. The restaurant um, ordering business is doing great. So. Um, yeah, take a look at our careers page, um, olo.com slash careers. Let me see if I can go back to that slide too. Um, and careers at olo.com if you have any questions or would like more information. And thank you guys so much for coming to tonight's event. Um, it will be, it has been recorded, it's being recorded, and um, it will be available in about one to two weeks on the Women Who Code Silicon Valley YouTube channel. And thanks again to Women Who Code um, and for all the great work that the women that code do. Um, and I think that's it. Thanks, Kate. Thanks, Wallace. It was a great event. Thanks again, everybody, for coming. And thank you.